So uh, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father God, as we open uh, the Bible, it's with a great reverence in our hearts and our minds. <coughs> We've been warned that if we approach it presumptuously, we can take the clearest passages, put our own spin on it, and end up uh, destroyed by our hubris. We want to be humble. We want to be teachable. We want to let the Bible explain itself and let the Holy Spirit be our guide. And thus we will fulfill Christ's desire for us as his disciples. Bless as we assemble in his name, studying this book that is called the Revelation of Jesus Christ. In his worthy name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome back. And if those who are you just finding, Jordan, welcome to your first night. And uh, most of us have been here a couple nights uh, or more. Uh, tonight's message is called The Light is Shining. And uh, this is a foundational message because I said in one of the earlier topics that prophecy is not given to satisfy human curiosity. Prophecy is given to establish a saving relationship with Jesus. And um, in that, he trades giving us knowledge and wisdom and uh, a trust of these uh, secrets that uh, the world doesn't know that we will find deliverance when the time of test comes. We will know how to act wisely and be preserved when destruction comes upon uh, the careless and the unbelieving. So tonight the light is shining is rooted in this passage which is gospel it's not strictly prophecy but it's a declaration Jesus is making about himself I have come as a light into the world whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness and um, again I want to just say we have gone through um, you can try to follow but I have a summary sheet with you every one of these uh, passages is on that summary sheet for tonight's lesson and you can go back at your leisure and um, the numbers on the right hand column uh, match up the numbers in that um, ver that broad version that binding of that bible uh, that is there so if you're a little unfamiliar with that just find the page and you should find the, the chapter and verse well scientists i wanted to find out how much stress is too much we know that there's something called eustress, good stress. It allows us to perform peak performance. Um, distress is when we have too much stress. And uh, performance suffers. And uh, even health suffers. So it's sort of a, a really a, a, almost a terrible question as how much pressure can we take without breaking? And of course, you leave it to scientists, they're going to apply more and more, like they're testing a girder on a bridge. They're going to test the stress to see how much it'll take before it succumbs. Well, here's what they did. It would be a little uh, against ethics to use human subjects. So they decided to experiment with lambs. And uh, so they took two twins, lambs, and um, put a lamb out in a pen. And um, the lamb couldn't see out over the walls. It was in a pen. And they hooked up electrodes to feeding stations so that when the lamb went to try to feed, uh, as he would start to uh, suck on a nipple that resembled uh, a nipple that his mother might have, uh, he would get shot. Isn't that terrible? It's terrible. Yeah, it'd be cruel sometimes. Yeah, well, it was. So, sure enough, there he goes. He's hungry, he went to the feeding station, and he got shot. And boy, he twitched and bolted and went around looking and found another feeding station. He thought, well, maybe this will be safe. And he tried eating there. And he got shocked there. And oh boy, now he's running around. He's really disturbed because um, he didn't know where to go. And uh, it seemed like every place that offered nurture shocked him. Now, here's the bad news. Being just a little lamb, he didn't have the coping mechanism and he just died a nervous twitching death. He just was overcome by anxiety and died. But now, let's take a look at what happened to his twin. Um, same age, this time they put the little lamb's mother in with him. Okay, so he's not alone, uh, the mom's there, and he goes to 
tried to eat, not from his mother, but from one of these feeding stations, and a shot came. Guess what happened? Ran to his mother. Nope. He complained to his mother. Oh. <laughs> and he didn't like it. And so the mother went back. back. It's like, I hear you. So he went to another one. And again, he got shot. And again, he complained. Bah! And the mother responded. Bah! Well, he went back to eating anyway. Even though he got shocked, he figured this is as good as it's going to get. <laughs> so he's, he's eating, he's feeding, and he's crumbling, and his mom's echoing. But then something happened when they kept shopping, shocking the lamb. The mother came over, and you, you could, for all intents, it looked like she came over and whispered something in the little lamb's ear. The scientist didn't know what it was, but um, she said something, and uh, he. It was like he understood, mom understood, and um, so when she did that one, come on, I got it. There we go. The, she just told him it's going to be that way. It's okay. And so he endured all the shocks, all the stress. He grew. It was like she just let him know it's not going to get any better. You just have to take it. And so we think about that when we have to bear our burdens alone. In this case, the mother sheep shared in the burden of stress with the lamb. She gave the lamb a coping mechanism that allowed him to continue to eat and feed even though um, he done, didn't like it. It was an unpleasant experience. Now we think about us. We have stresses in our life. and Many of our stresses are put on us by our our outside culture, sometimes the government demands, uh, some people get drafted in the army sometimes, uh, it's weather, but a lot of our stress is something we call baggage. We pick it up because it's the residue of our own wrong decisions. And out of those wrong decisions, so we sometimes experience guilt, we sometimes experience worry and anxiety, uh, we sometimes experience insecurity, how can I get on top, am I going to be a loser, um, wh where can I go to improve my life, my life choices, and uh, that's the question we begin to ask, and the book of Revelation takes humanity at this vulnerable point, and offers something very positive that the book of Revelation offers you strength to handle your stresses, and uh, Jesus Christ is the conquering king. He's the one is your asset. He's your friend. He's your um, ability to cope as we watch and see everything he promises to do. In the book of Revelation, chapters five, uh, chapter five, five and six, he's portrayed as a lion, king of beasts. He's in charge, lion of the tribe of Judah in a world of chaos. He is a place where there is stability, there is strength, there is comfort, and um, Elsewhere, he's pictured as, as labeled a mighty conqueror, an overcomer, a powerful one. And so all we have to do is align our lives with him and he will give us strength to cope where we would otherwise um, be just paralyzed by anxiety. Angels are found crying out in the book of Revelation 5 verse 12. They cry out, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. And so we have a picture now. We've seen a picture on a previous night of the enemy of humankind called the dragon. Okay, now we have Revelation portraying a lamb, and the lamb is our friend. Dragon is our enemy, lamb is our friend, and you would think that a lamb is not going to be very much, uh, what should we say, of an opponent to a dragon. But the curious thing about the book of Revelation, I'll get to that in another slide, is that um, this more, the lamb is more than a match for the dragon. Uh, the Bible says that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. That's the A to Z in the Greek alphabet. That's the beginning and the ending. Uh, and he's everything in between. He's victorious. He, he fills history with the record of his strength, if we let him. He'll fill our history with the record of his strength, if we let him. So Jesus is portrayed in the book of Revelation as a winner. He's more than victorious, he's a mighty winner. And the people who are with him 
It says they love not their lives to the death. They're willing to become collateral damage if they have to, to be with Jesus. And when they align themselves with Jesus, what does it say about them? They too are winners. They too are overcomers. And so um, there we see Revelation talking about this charismatic figure that we all want to connect to, Jesus. Uh, he's seen in a glorified state, in a vision, in Revelation, starting with Revelation 1, 2, and 3, he's walking among some candlesticks. And um, as he's walking along, he's, he's offering counsel, he's there to encourage, and the candlesticks represent churches. And so Jesus is seen in close connection to his church. One of the things that we want to say about these prophecies that will unfold is that the prophecies are there to grant both the church corporately and to saints individually deliverance from the dragon. Amen. And so we have this all outflowing of, of information through prophecy, but we see this council in the beginning of the book where he's offering wisdom to his churches, strength to his churches, occasionally rebuke to his churches, guidance to his churches, um, affirmation to his churches. You read that and you'll see that it, it's a love letter from Jesus to his churches. I'm with you. I understand what you're going through and I'm there to bring you victory. Revelation 1, 1 says that all of this book is a revelation of Jesus Christ. So uh, while we might say it's a revelation of human history, it's a revelation of various things, a struggle between good and evil, it's primarily his revelation to us of himself and his saving uh, activity, his saving desire, his saving strategy for us. And so it reveals Jesus as all of this and uh, we're going to study the primary role of Jesus in prophecy. Not only is his uh, the voice of the wisdom providing this knowledge and prophecy, but he wants us to understand if we wanted to use maybe a, an earthly colloquialism, we know that he was here on earth and he went back to his father, but we might ask the question, what in the heavens is Jesus doing now? I said it's a little colloquialism, but the book of Revelation will inform us just what is what has Jesus been up to since the cross? What is he doing between the time of the cross and when he says, I will come again? When, what's, what is he up to in that intro? And uh, we'll find that out as the nights proceed. Revelation 1 5. Um, he is called the faithful witness. If he's going to reveal something that purports to be a secret, it's not going to be a mere rumor, it's not going to be disinformation. He is going to tell you the truth. He's the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of this earth. So, no matter how stacked you think evil is against the people of God, he is still the ruler over the kings of this earth. And we may take confidence in that knowledge that he is in charge of human history. Revelation 12, 5 talks about uh, the entrance of Jesus into the history of earth. It talks about a woman who's vulnerable. She's pregnant, about to be delivered. And, and right there in front of her, in we might say in the very birthing room, there is a dragon and he's trying to snatch up the child as soon as it's born. And of course, we find that in the story he tried to do that, could not, fail. Uh, but she successfully bore a male child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. That's his prophetic destiny is to become a ruler. And with a rod of iron mean it's, it's, it's non-negotiable. No one's going to challenge it. There is ultimate strength in the rule of this child, uh, not in the sense of cruelty, but in the sense of permanency, that he is going to rule uh, with a sense of permanency. Of course, we know that the, the woman who is to bring forth the male child is Mary, and uh, he's a savior, and uh, he was caught up to God and to his throne, which we understand that's what he did after he was resurrected. He was on earth for long enough for there to be witnesses of his resurrection, and then there were also witnesses when he was caught up to God and to his throne. But let's follow the... Um, the message of this chapter, this verse. And her child was caught up to God in his throne. That's Revelation. The next thing we want to jump to uh, is in verse, in chapter 14, which we said before is the core, uh, the climax of the book. 
everything important happens in the middle of a, um, a Jewish thought uh, process where they use a, an X figure of logic where they have a, a number of paragraphs of importance preceding the climax, climactic thought, the core thought, and then you have other thoughts laminating it from behind on the other side and we find that the book of Revelation is written in that kind of sense. Everything is building up in the, in the book of Revelation to some great climax of history. And chapter 14 describes that climax where Jesus comes to reap the harvest of the earth. And that's, that's the climax of Jesus' saving ministry is when he actually comes to separate us from the hazards of sin. He's going to take us all to be with him comes to reap the harvest of the earth. As verse 14 of that chapter, I looked and behold a white cloud and on the cloud sat one like the son of man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a reaping instrument, a sharp sickle. So before that there's two harvests from planet earth, there is uh, described a harvest of wheat, which is the good harvest. We want to be a part of the harvest of wheat. Also, later on in this chapter, there's a harvest of grapes, and grapes um, is a bloody enterprise, and we don't want to be a part of the harvest of the grapes of wrath. We want to be a part of the harvest of wheat. And uh, so good things happen from the first harvest, the second harvest, the harvest of the grapes of wrath is for sinners who are not going to participate in the blessings of the redeemed. They are going to be lost eternally. Revelation 19 portrays Jesus again it's sort of a, an expanded notion where Jesus is coming as a conquering king he comes riding on a symbolic white horse he's never lost a battle um, he's never lost a war and he is the one who will defeat Satan uh, from Genesis from Revelation 1 all the way to Revelation 22 every chapter there's a hero he might be front and center he might be just sort of showing up as a part of the scenery, uh, but in every chapter there is Jesus Christ. And I want you to understand that as we begin to talk about Jesus on prophecy, you cannot get a correct understanding of Bible prophecy if you just talk about politics here on earth. Just talk about who who is ruling what, where, when. This is all the story of Jesus. And all the symbols of Christ in Revelation point to different aspects. He's a dying lamb, a sacrificial lamb. Of course, he's also a conquering king as a, as a lion of the tribe of Judah offers. He is there for us in strength. But the most common appellation, the most common image used of Jesus is the word lamb. 27 times in the book of Revelation, he's portrayed as a lamb. Now, yeah, I think you know here in America we, we have a sort of a warped sense. We we root for a favorite football team because they're cowboys and they take out care of big cattle. Nobody ever wants to root for a team called the Shepherds. <laughs> and it's quite a come down to think about for all of our human abilities that heaven looks down and says, You guys are about as dumb as sheep. And you're about as resourceful as sheep. But then along comes King David and he turns it into a positive. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I can go through all kinds of high-risk situations with the Lord is my shepherd and I'm going to come out okay very well. So Jesus is a lamb 27 times. We want to absorb that in image what it means that it's not a an inglorious thing. It's a a portrayal of innocence, a portrayal of holiness, a portrayal of um, unselfishness, um, and yet, uh, and how do I say that, although God is all-powerful, uh, we don't fear lambs. So there's nothing about a relationship with Jesus that we should be afraid of. I look, says John, behold, in the midst of the throne stood a lamb as though it had been slain, not sure how that is. Usually when a lamb has been killed, it's lying pretty flat. This one is standing as though it had been slain, meaning there's probably still some blood on it. That, it has red around it. Yes, has some red there. 
So it's a bloody lamb, as though it's slain, but it's standing in the midst of the throne. So it, it's an enduring lamb. It, it can't destroy this lamb. The lamb actually was slain from how far ago? From the foundation of the world. It was in the design of, of heaven that Jesus would die when this world was created. In the distant ages, my notes remind me, of eternity, Father and Son met in a divine council about the need and the, the plan to save fallen human beings and the Father would be the sender. He would sacrifice that way. The Son would be the one who was sent and he would be willing to come and be the sacrifice for sin. And in all of this, we see a God of infinite love. Heaven is taking care of humanity in its fail-safe mode. Now, Revelation 12, we are introduced to this dragon-like beast. And of course, it was the one that was in heaven, but now we watch it on earth, and it's attacking the Lamb, Jesus. Satan is trying to attack Jesus and nullify his influence. And when he can't take out Jesus at his birth, and, and when Jesus did not succumb to the grave and came out of the grave, now he is left to make war with the followers of Jesus. If I can't take out Jesus, I want to make him upset by warring against his followers. But notice, they overcame him. The followers of Jesus can take on the devil's worst and come off victorious. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. That's something that is gifted to them. But now, they have a role to play too. They have to evidence their relationship to that blood by willing to give their own verbal testimony I believe in Jesus I believe I'm a follower of Jesus and I believe that that he will take care of me and so the word of the testimony would come at, the, at sometimes at the end of a spear or just before a uh, fire was getting lit many times it would mean death to them to give that testimony and so the word of the testimony is not a cheap thing to say I believe in Jesus I love Jesus I'm a follower of Jesus it's a testimony that may be costly here in this room it's not that much of a cost because we don't sense only uh, maybe a slight embarrassment if we don't get the words out in exact order but there's no real risk to confess Jesus in this room. We can say praise the Lord for that. Not yet. Not yet. But someday it may be that way. Once again, the lamb is triumphant over the dragon. And the dragon, if you remember, is tied to some religious systems. We've introduced it already just verbally a little bit, but the, the idea of Babylon is confusion, spiritual confusion, a religious system of spiritual confusion, and the Lamb is going to be victorious over that confused religious system because he is holy and he deals in truth only and not lies and falsehood. And he makes sure that everyone worships God with purity and truth and not idolatry or some form of uh, false worship. Revelation 17, these, meaning those who are not on God's side, will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. So we don't want to take on the Lamb. It may seem like he's a pushover and easy to get rid of and dispense with permanently, but the Lamb will overcome all uh, opponents and be, be victorious. And so tonight we want to ask ourselves, we have to take a side. There's no neutrality in this war. Everyone on planet Earth is going to side by their life, their decisions, by their mindset, their outlook, if they're willing to be a non-worshipper of the Lamb or if they've given their all to become a follower of Jesus. And so we're going to ask that later tonight and give you a chance. If you've done it before, well and good. If you haven't ever done it before, well, tonight's a night going to be an opportunity to make sure that heaven knows you're choosing Jesus because you want to be victorious with the Lamb. He's Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Those who are with Him are called, chosen, and faithful. Those are some of the attributes of those who, against all the, the tensions against them, they're going to stay with Jesus. They're called, they're chosen, and they're faithful. Now let's trace, just for a few more minutes, this symbolism 
of how the lamb reaches out down and, and, and touches our lives today. You're a popular person tonight. There you go. So now let's think about this. If we are with the Lamb and letting Him touch our lives today, number one, will we see light shining from the Lamb into our life? Will we see Jesus teaching our lives, giving us counsel on a daily basis from His Word? Will we find that He is an asset against guilt? Will He liberate us from sin and bondage to it? Will He give us the confidence of assurance of eternal life so that we don't have to live a life uh, weighed down by by anxiety over the future is so let's look and see by telling that bible story where we might find ourselves remember adam and eve and they disobeyed a direct command do not eat of a tree they ate of that tree seemed like a small thing but it was called sin and one sin is enough to remove that connection uh that intimate connection they had with god they no longer trusted him and so they were willing to be on Satan's side, at least for a while. And they became susceptible to dying. But most importantly, by that one sin, they destroyed the absolute and total purity of their characters. And now they had to climb out of a pit called sin. Romans 6.23 says, The wages and the outcome, the fruit of sin, is something called death. They didn't know what death was. They would soon come to find out that death is not a pretty picture and um, it means the ending of life mm -hmm. and the ending of a relationship and uh, how much they must have sorrowed uh, with the, even the leaves dying and when, when their one son murdered his brother they had to, to uh, bury a son who was faithful to God and by a brother who did not believe in that way but there was this design that we didn't have to die because of sin. There would be a lamb, a substitute. And they were to bring that lamb and let that lamb die in our place. Now this started in the Garden of Eden, at the gates of Eden anyway. And then we find that when Moses came along, uh, we find that it gets written in the books of, uh, of uh, Leviticus and others where there is an outline of how to do this sacrifice, uh, both for a corporate meaning and for an individual uh, remedy for sin. Here's what it says in Leviticus 17, 11. For it's the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Why would that be necessary? Well, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. So the, the blood is a symbol of life that must be exchanged in order that we might have connection to life because if we are connected with our sin we can only expect death but if we can have something that will satisfy that and make atonement for that then we can anticipate life instead of death and so for centuries there was a substitutionary sacrificial system that was designed to show not that we can be cruel to animals but that for us to find salvation somebody had to die somebody and that somebody was the Lamb of God that somebody was the Son of God that somebody was actually a part of God himself part of the Godhead the Son of God came to shed his blood to pay for humans mistakes and as Adam watched that innocent lamb die his heart was broken now some of you think well that wouldn't be too bad you just bring the lamb and the priest would do it all no 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 now, when you brought that lamb, uh, you had to bring the sacrifice, but then if it was your sin, you're the one that had to slit the throat. And the priest would catch the, use a bowl and catch the blood, and he would help you from there. But you had to be complicit in taking the life of an innocent being because you were the one that was guilty. And so every day animal sacrifices were slain in the sanctuary and uh, this was a part of the worship of God was to recognize that sin is an awful thing. It always takes a life of something innocent. And so when the sinner brought that lamb, uh, it's symbolizing the need for more than that lamb. 
Uh, the New Testament teaches this, that those sacrifices never did anything really to, to change the conscience of them, but we need that once and for all sacrifice of Jesus that will take care of the sin problem. And so we, we find here's a little story about a man by a fictional man by the name of Josiah. He has a fight with his neighbor and leaves him with a black guy and bloody nose. He goes to his neighbor and says, I'm sorry I lost my temper. And uh, he's guilty, but maybe the, the neighbor knows he has to live with him. So he says, no, just forget about it. But Josiah has to still take a lamb to the temple and the tabernacle and he is watched as he goes. Everybody sees, there he goes, he's guilty. He got in that fight, now he's gonna try to make it better. And he goes and he slits his throat. The priest helps him by catching the blood in the basin. And they put that blood on the horns of the altar, the flesh of the animal is consumed on the altar. And then some of that blood is brought into the sanctuary and it is white. A few drops of blood are white in the sanctuary there. And so he's now free. The guilt has been transferred from him to the sanctuary. And the record of sins is building up uh, a record of guilt. The Bible says in Leviticus 5, 5 and 6, it shall be when he is guilty in any of these matters and he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing, he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord for his sin which he has committed, and he shall be the blood of the, let me get back here, the blood of the lamb will make an atonement for him. But it's all a process which, which even those who are illiterate could understand. There's something you have to do to put a distance between your guilt in order to be saved. You have to have, to have some form of an atonement. So we ask ourselves, why did God require the sacrifice? Did they cleanse the people of sin? No. Did they merely represent something else? I'd like to think that's the, the better answer. They pointed, pointed forward to a different sacrifice, a better sacrifice. I already suggested we find the answer in the book of Hebrews. So let's go to Hebrews and see what Hebrews has to say about Jesus the Lamb as our sacrifice. Hebrews 9, 11, and 12. But Christ came as high priest of good things to come with greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that's not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And so Jesus is our great lamb. And he's the one that takes sin and separates us from us. And Hebrews goes on to say, So Christ, the anointed one, Jesus, Son of God, was offered once to bear the sins of many. This one sacrifice is all of a take, and that's God's plan of salvation. Now, some years ago, a young woman came listening to a series of meetings similar to the one we're doing right here and she wanted to get some counsel from a pastor and she had a, a huge load of guilt and all that she could get out was I have a great uh, load of guilt I've done something terrible I have a hard time even talking about it and uh, so all these years before she had had an affair and she would gotten pregnant to hide it all she had an abortion and so she's troubled because in her heart she felt she had actually taken the life of innocent life and God was still holding her accountable for it and she hadn't enjoyed relationships with men ever since and it's a tragic wrong breaking her heart how can I be free of this and so he said well if you lived in Old Testament times it would have been simple you would have just taken a lamb to the tabernacle your guilt would be transferred to the lamb the lamb would die but now we're not living in Old Testament times but you still have a lamb. You don't bring a lamb to a priest today, but if you let Jesus be your lamb and let his sacrifice take care of your guilt, you can be free of that. All you need to do now is to come to him, not to me, but come to him, confess your sin, and he will take it from you, and your guilt record will be wiped clean. Why? Because of the blood of the lamb, that lamb will be your atonement. So every lamb anciently pointed forward to the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. But to be free from our guilt, we don't have to kill a lamb, but we do have to do something. We must first acknowledge it. Now, as a little child, 
I grew up in a Christian home. And I was told that I was to confess my faults as I understood them. You know, like taking a cookie when my mom said I had to wait till after the meal. There were those are little sins that ch children have. But it, it was quite one thing to just go very quickly, forgive me my sins, or to slow down and say, you know, I, uh, I was kind of rude to the neighbor boy today. And uh, I didn't quite tell the truth to my mother. I mean, when you start rehearsing the litany of your actual misdeeds, that's when a cleansing can take place because you are now accepting accountability for those specific actions, specific attitudes that caused sin to come into your life. And so we, when we talk about becoming free from guilt, it's learning to be honest with God in what we come to. And I'll tell you why. He already knows the truth. He wants to see if you're man enough, if you're woman enough, to admit it to Him. And if you admit it to Him, His heart is filled with gladness. Because He realizes that's the biggest step toward healing there is, is for you to acknowledge your need of Him. And when you understand your need of Jesus, and you confess those sins, He can do something for you. For the wage of the sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There it is, that atonement from the substitute for our sin. His payment is enough for all of our sins. So, we're left with this conclusion. If I come to Jesus and confess my sin, then the burden of guilt is rolled away. I leave a question there. Because there's still this element of believing that he'll do that. Satan might have us think that our sins are too big. He's not doing that for us. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more so the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot in this world, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And you know, I can just tell you from my, um, my own testimony, one of the reasons I'm a Christian is I like to have a clear conscience. And in Jesus, I can have that once I've admitted my mistake. He can wipe that clean. Not only he can remove my guilt, but I find this, that and the more I meditate on this, I learn to steer clear of those moments of temptation. I learn how to, to not become a victim all over again. And so I grow in grace, as the Bible says. Now, it's one thing to be a volunteer, but you can't earn your way to heaven. Righteous comes only by having a right place with God, and that is always a gift. As the Bible will tell us here, we come and kneel, we can confess, but we wait for that element of faith to believe that it has been a gift for us. And that Jesus can take away our guilt. Second Corinthians 5 20, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. I love that exchange. It's, it's a perfect barter system where we have nothing, He has everything. So God the Father made His Son to be sin for us so that He could look at us with the same way He looks at His righteous Son. And it's a perfect exchange. As Jesus hung on the cross, He ex obviously experienced great pain from that pursuit, but I think the major pain was more than that of the the nails, the crown on his head, um, the physical suffering. I think he was bearing a broken heart from the weight of your sins and mine. That's what killed him, because he he cried out, and you could say it was despair. I'd like to say he cried out in faith, but it was a bewildered faith. My God, my God. Now, I don't care how you want to emphasize the last clause. Why have you forsaken me? His disciples have already forsaken him. Why have you forsaken me? Or, my God, my, why have you forsaken me? Notice, you know, what did I do to get this? However, the, the, he, was, he was agonizing over that gap, that separation, which sin causes. 
And in that, Jesus is bearing, and this is his evidence, his testimony, he's bearing the guilt of humanity. It's crushing out his life. Usually crucifixion took days. He was dead in a matter of a couple hours. And uh, Pilate wanted a little extra evidence. Are you sure he's dead? And so they pierced him. Remember that? And blood and water came out, so they knew he was already dead. But here's the good news. Because of the cross of Jesus, because of the blood of the atonement, because of all this sacrificing Lamb of God, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Paul's writing to baby Christians, and he's telling them, don't be puffed up, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, lest it's a gift to God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. When you get to heaven, I get to heaven, none of one of us will have a thing to boast about that we're there. We're there by the grace of God alone. Amen. It's been a gift. Now, when we've been given a great gift, it's amazing how our attitude changes about God. Before, we didn't care if He was happy with us or not. Now, we long to do what pleases Him. <coughs> and so a life of faith and obedience is typical for a life of someone who believes they've been saved from their mistakes, and saved from sin and the consequences of death. And so we have... A simple prayer. We can each pray, Lord, give me the gift of salvation. Give me the gift of salvation. I come with an open heart. I come to the cross. I come believing that Jesus is my lamb. I kneel before the cross. I'm confessing my sin. The burden of guilt. Take it off my shoulders because it's been put on Jesus. I'm forgiven. I'm redeemed. First Peter 1, 18 and 19 talks about this blessed state of redemption. You were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Amen. There's only one source. There's only, uh, how many, was it, um, about eight pints of blood in a human body? There's not much of it, but just a drop of it goes around, and that's all you need to avail to cleanse you of your sin. So the invitation is come now. Don't wait till you're better. Don't wait till you've conquered some bad habit. Don't wait till you've cleaned up uh, your your record of your sin your sins as best you just come right now come with all the guilt come with all your sins and uh, start your process of the five steps to receive the gift of eternal life from Jesus I put them on on the side there so that the as you want to go home and study this the five steps are very simple they're all biblical and the first one is to accept the fact that God loves you remember that that was destroyed when when Adam and Eve sinned, they, they began to doubt that God loved them. And so the prophets, one of the voices of the prophets is to tell us God has loved us from way at the beginning, before we ever knew it. He's been drawing us to Him. And then it takes a moment of acceptance that who we are with our failures and our imperfection, God loves me. And so that's step one is to, to begin to say with faith, God loves me. I've loved you with everlasting love, he says. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. And second, I have to recognize I can't save myself. I can't get out of this mess I'm in by any of my human resources. Tried all sorts of, of stratagems, whatever. It, there's guilt. And if I were, as I counseled um, one young lady who called me in the middle of the night, and she says, I, I, I don't know why I'm calling you, but I, I want to kill myself. She says, I was supposed to talk to my caseworker. I was supposed to talk to their away on vacation, so I'm talking to you. I said, why do you want to kill yourself? She says, well, I have all this bad inside of me. And when I cut my wrist, it all comes out. I says, that sounds like a plan, except it has one flaw. I says, by the time all the bad in you comes out, there won't be anything left for you to enjoy. Yeah. You'll be dead. I says, so you can try that, and I, I understand you want to be right with God, but let me suggest something to you that has worked for me. I realized that no matter what I did to try to let out all the bad, I couldn't do it. But I could let Jesus blood take care of my problem. And I look to him and he's already shed his blood so I don't have to sh shed my blood and you don't have to shed your blood. And I, I just want you to look to Jesus right now and trust that he loves you and he shed his blood so your bad could come out. 
when his blood came out. We prayed over and she's now an active Christian. She turned the corner of life. But she was about to just end it all because she thought it was up to her to get all the bad out. Simple steps. You can't get it out yourself. All of sin falls short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption is a humiliating word. It means you need to be saved. You can't save yourself. You need to be rescued. You can't rescue yourself. You need to depend on somebody else because you can't do it yourself. But being redeemed is a wonderful word when it happens and you realize that wherever you, that place of torment were, where you were, whatever place of loss you were at, it has been flipped and now you're in a place of safety. And you have been redeemed because of Jesus. Three, believe Jesus can and will save you. Um, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoso believeth in Him Shall not perish. What's, what do we get instead of perishing? Everlasting life. Oh, I love that. Everlasting life. Hallelujah. There it is. Everlasting life. You can't save yourself. It's impossible. But God will save you. You gotta trust Him. Four. Step four. We've touched about it. We come back around to it. There is this thing where Jesus expects a sinner who's been saved to be willing to confess his sin. If you don't confess your sin, He can't do anything with it. If you confess it and believe you're forgiven, He can do something with that and remove it from your life's record permanently. But it requires this element of confession. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and furthermore to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That, that cleanse to me is has shades of meaning of beyond the past tense. It has to do with He's going to keep us clean. Amen? He's going to work to keep us clean so we don't uh, be in that extreme situation ever again. And five, claim his gift of eternal life as, a, as yours and decide to serve him forever. It's a commitment. You can't supply the power, but you can su supply the decision. You know what I'm saying? I want to be on Jesus' side. I don't want to be on the dragon side. I don't want to be on Babylon's side. Uh, in, the, in the end of time, I want to be with those who follow Jesus. One uh, pastor has put this way in a very concise way. Here is a man or woman born in sin, past ridiculed with wicked, and it's riddled, not ridiculed, riddled, riddled with wicked choices. In some way, the love of God shining from the cross of Calvary reaches the heart. The person yields, repents, confesses, and by faith claims Christ as his or her Savior. And the instant that is done, that person is accepted as a child of God. <coughs> all the sins are forgiven. All the guilt is canceled. All is, that person, he or she, is accounted righteous and stands approved. The biblical word is justified before God. It means set right. Everything that you would see wrong has been made right. This amazing miraculous change may take place in one short moment. It's called righteousness by faith. The moment you believe, you are now accorded as if you've never sinned. Isn't that incredible? Amen. Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. The old things have become new. It's a, it's a new life you're now living. Of course, Satan's going to challenge that. He's going to say, how dare you think you escaped me that easy? But if you can surrender your life to Christ, you're going to find that a different will is given to you, a different heart is given to you, a different locus of, of importance. Instead of living for yourself, you want to live for a significant other. Jesus um, said in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives to me will come to me. There's two words come there. Just in the original, it was only once. I didn't get the time to take that out. All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me, I will be no means cast out. So whatever has been in your past record, don't worry about that. Just head for Jesus. He will not deny you. <coughs> Jesus decided your worth when he died for you. His righteousness in you makes you valuable. Credited to you. He did that for you. You're valuable. 
So let's meet this Jesus one final time before we go home for the night. Not everybody comes to these meetings having read the Gospels. Not everybody has understood the whole story of Jesus, but this Jesus is, is a man that when he was here, he cleansed lepers, which, which is an incurable disease. He healed sufferers. He forgave sinners. People knew that anybody who would come to him would receive what they needed from him. The blind people saw. The deaf people could hear. Lame people could walk. Those who had no voice at all could sing and, uh, and talk and praise God. And, and um, children loved to be around him because joy and peace and love flowed out from his very being. He was somebody you would love to be in the room with you. And you would want to take, just leave your work and go follow him. He spoke and took time for people individually. He ministered not just to crowds, but to the one person interview. He always took time for people because his life was one of service. He wore himself out in service to humanity. And here's a miracle thing for me. Every person he met, he learned their name and he never forgot it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel guilty by that one, but they, he would learn their name, and they were so important to him, he would never forget their name. And he knew their individual burdens, their needs, nothing would cause him to ignore them or belittle them. There was only one thing, Jesus never forced himself on anybody who didn't want it. He was never rude. He was never argumentative. He was never like you're gonna you're gonna deal with me because I'm here. He never was that way. He was very humble and he was very approachable, and people loved him. In his presence, even death had to flee away. He broke up every funeral we know that he ever attended, mm -hmm. uh, and his death would provide life for the entire human race. We know that. One of the crowning miracles of his life was to bring his friend Lazarus back from the dead. And uh, so he, he gave evidence that he had power over the grave and of death. Sin had no rulership over him. He said that sin has nothing in me. Days before his crucifixion, the throngs crowded around him, said a political word, Hosanna. Hosanna is not the same as hallelujah. Hosanna is a military term of, we'll follow you anywhere, you be our leader. And so they were looking at Jesus to be the, the captain of the armies of God. Uh, that's one of the, one version of the Bible talks about God being the, the Lord of armies. And they were looking to Jesus to be that kind of uh, warrior to bring them freedom. Jesus, of course, chose to reveal the Father's love and grace. He did not choose to take up any action of bloodshed to bring military victory, but he wanted to bring spiritual victory to every person he connected to. And in Jesus, by his life, by his death, love gets revealed, and uh, we saw the truest picture of God. If you don't know who God in heaven is, look who Jesus on earth revealed himself to be. That's the God we serve. Who is it that hangs on Calvary's cross? Who is it that has nails in his hand? Who is it that bears the guilt of the world? Can anybody really walk past that without noticing? Can anyone not respond to love like that? God wants you to know he cares for you that much. For God so loved the world. Notice that the word so just accentuates the amount of love. It's, I know mothers are really good at this. They have a hard time telling how much they love their little babies. So they just say, I love you so. I love you so. How much is so? Well, you can't total it up, can you? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whoever believes in him. Not. So if you're here tonight, you belong to whoever. I have one little story I'll tell just in closing. Because we're called to, to experience this same kind of love, even though it seems otherworldly, it seems supernatural. Um, in the 1990s, it was a terrible time in Rwanda where your ethnicity, uh, your genetic makeup, uh, uh, half of Rwanda uh, was sh sort of short and stumpy. And if people saw you short and stumpy and stocky, looking a lot like 
a black version of a Dutchman, you would be a Hutu. And if you were tall and slender, you'd be a Tutsi. And, and, and within families, they intermarried. And, and of course, if you had one tall, skinny son, he'd be a Tutsi. And if you had a short, chubby son, he could be a Hutu in one family. But because they did, they, it was just a profile. They profile each other. And uh, during that terrible time, um, they would take, and even in the church, um, a certain Christian pastor and two sons were brutally murdered by a violent mob. The wife survived. But she had seen a, a certain young man with machete kill her own sons before the mob attacked her. And then after that, uh, the young man who f killed her son fled and hid in the mountains. But after three years, she saw him again. This time, um, he's in jail. He'd been caught. He Other people had witnessed that. And, and so she told him, you must become my son. Mm. Why? Well, you took my son. You must become my son. And so she loved him. She she visited him. She brought him food in prison. And uh, when he was finally released from prison, he came to live with her in her own home. You see, he came to understand love and forgiveness in a way that he had never understood in his culture before. Because she knew about Jesus' love. She knew that what she had been forgiven of, and she wanted to pass that grace, that mercy, that forgiveness on to somebody else who desperately needed it too. And that's what is calling us tonight, that if we have people we know in our life that we could hold a grudge against, we need to find a way to forgive them and help them sense the love of Jesus. Romans 3, 23, 24, for all of sin, fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. And so everyone can participate. Revelation 22, 17. Now that's, again, we're talking about Jesus and prophecy. The Spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. And so Jesus' last words in, in the whole book of the Bible, the Revelation, is don't let anything stop you. If you hear this invitation for redemption, take advantage. Come. Come, taste life. Let him who thirsts come. Let him who desires, let him take the water of life freely. So, are you one of those that's thirsty? I know I'm thirsty for that kind of love. I'm thirsty for that kind of forgiveness. I'm thirsty for that kind of mercy. I want more and more of his grace in my life. I want it in your life too. Uh, I want you to find it in the study of the book of Revelation, I want you to find it in your acceptance of the gospel story as I've told it tonight because the light that is the light of the world is Jesus. And the best story is not the story of prophecy. The best story is he loves you to save you. And we told that tonight. That's going to open your heart to hear what he's going to do for his church and what he's going to do in history. And that, that's a wonderful story too. But now it's time for us to decide what are we going to do with this Jesus. So I have a friend in the back who's going to hand you out a little card and I worked this up from scratch and I, I put all this important stuff in except for you. I left the most important thing out. I didn't put the word name. <laughs> so this does me no good unless you decide to personalize it. So find some place in the border, the margin, up on the top or down below. Please put your name on first of all. And then we're going to just look at these options standing here in the light of the cross. And the light that is shining from the book of Revelation and from the Gospels. Number one, I understand that salvation is a free gift from God through faith in Christ I cannot earn. I can only depend on His righteousness for salvation. Now this is one of these things where just check every one you want to apply to you. Some of them may not apply at all, and that's fine. But hopefully everyone can put a, a little check or an X on that one. Put your names on paper. Yes, I already said that, but I'll say it one more time, please. Before we get very far again, put your name, first and last name. Number two, I would like to accept Jesus as my Savior. Ask him to forgive my sins, live in my heart, 
transformed my life. So that's a very personal way of accepting this story into your uh, journey in life tonight. You want this to begin for you. And it's already begun. You want to just testify that it's there and you want it to stay there. <coughs> Number three may not apply to you, but you'd be surprised how many Christians feel that Jesus has always been there for them, but they haven't always been there for Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I once knew Jesus, but fell away. It's my decision to surrender my heart to him again tonight and let him be the Lord of my life. So, and somehow you feel that your promises to Jesus have lapsed if you want him to forgive you. Just put a check in our legs on number three. Some of you um, have never been baptized. You know, that's a biblical kind of thing that people connect to Jesus through baptism. And if you're interested in baptism or rebaptism, because the, heart, the Holy Spirit has been sort of touching your life, touching your heart, that that would be something, a blessing that would match up with your journey. But check there. Now, number five, we're going to take the initiative that everybody is going to say yes to that one. I would like information on how to have a living relationship with Jesus, where I have a free hand of a Christian classic called, as I come with some of the titles, this is called Hope for the Hurting, and it's uh, a little uh, booklet, not even 100 pages long, not even maybe 60 pages, a classic on how to have Jesus in your heart and in your life in a way that is rewarding and filling and meaningful. A living relationship with Jesus. When you're done with that, you can turn them over like that. And if you just pass them through your neighbor to the aisle, my helper in the back, I'll let you go. What we want to do is we want to pray over these together. Because this is a form of confessing Jesus. Jesus said, whoever confesses me before man, I'll confess before my Father. Meaning, they're mine. And if you can't find what you need to confess, your connection with Jesus, then he says, I can't confess you to my Father. We just want to make it easy for you to feel united with Jesus. It's okay. Okay, we can okay. rectify that. Please bow your head. Let's pray together. Father God, I am humbled by the opportunity to pray for these dear souls for whom you died. So I can encourage them in their walk with Jesus in any way. May that occur. If I can help them understand Bible prophecy a little more clearly, may that also occur. But tonight, the business is a relationship with Jesus. May the prayer we share together, each for the other, that we want to meet together sometime uh, with Jesus in glory. We want to celebrate that love in a way that calls forth uh, a kind of praise we can only dream about giving. We, we can't sing that well, we can't play a harp, but somewhere in, the, in your idea of the future, you give us instrumentalities, both stringed instruments and voices to praise your name, and we'll say, Thou art worthy, for Thou hast reigned. Let that reign begin in our hearts tonight, I pray. In the worthy name of Jesus, who loved us. Amen. Amen. So, on tomorrow night, um, on Wednesday night, Jesus, the end time lamb, we're going to build upon the idea of Jesus now, is going to insert himself in prophecy past the cross. This was tonight of Jesus inserting himself at the cross into human history, but we're going to see how the book of Revelation shows that Jesus is going to be active as an agency of salvation for his church throughout human history, especially as it gets down near the end of time when he's going to return. So Jesus, the end time lamb, and taking on the dragon. It's a strategic kind of message. Please come and listen and learn. May God bless you with a safe trip home. Amen.